This is a video in my series on cranial nerve palsies. I get, as a strabismus specialist, I get quite a few people who come in with acute cranial nerve palsies. So I want to start by talking about the anatomy of the nerves that control the eye and move it around. So the eye has six muscles that move the eye. You have these two vertical muscles that move the eye up and down. You have horizontal muscles that move the eye side by side. And then you have these two somewhat confusing muscles. One of my patients called them doorknob muscles that have a torsional and depressing effect and a torsional and elevating effect on the eye. Kind of like a doorknob, you can grab it and twist it. So for all those muscles, there's only three nerves that control them all. There's a busy nerve that controls this one, this one, this one, this happens to be a right eye, uh, and this one. There's a lonely nerve that controls this muscle and pulls it out towards the ear. And that's the one we're gonna talk about today. And uh, there is a lonely one that controls this muscle and moves the eye down and around like this. Now, all of those nerves are numbered. They're also named. Um, they were numbered by the early anatomists who basically the easiest way to access the brain was to take off the top of the calvarium and to examine it. And then they counted everything that poked out. And uh, roughly half of the things that poke out from the brain. There's actually 12 pairs or 24 nerves that, that directly connect to the brain. Half of them go to the eye in one way or another. The first one doesn't. The first one's the olfactory nerve and rarely do I check that. Sometimes I'll use a little isopropyl alcohol and check people's uh, uh, ability to smell, but very rarely. Um, neurologists do that all the time. Uh, the second nerve is the optic nerve, and that, of course, from an ophthalmology standpoint, is our most important nerve because it transmits all of the visual information to the brain. It's our, the cable that might, the cable that plugs your your uh, monitor or your television into your your VCR or or, or uh, the CPU, and. Uh, so that's the, 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 the second cranial nerve. The third cranial nerve is this busy one I mentioned earlier that controls this muscle, this muscle, this muscle, and this muscle. It's called the oculomotor nerve. Uh, the early anatomists only numbered it because they didn't know what it did, but we now know what it does and it's got, gotten another name. And uh, so th uh, that nerve also controls the pupil diameter and keeps the lids open as well, so it's very busy. And uh, that will be the subject of another video. The fourth nerve uh, controls this muscle and pulls the eye down and around like this. That's called the trochlear nerve because this strange muscle originates, uh, as do four of the other muscles, behind the eye in an area called the annulus of zilm that surrounds the optic nerve. And this particular muscle starts back here behind the eye, but then it goes up through a little pulley system and turns a significant corner in order to attach to the eye. So even though the muscle, and all muscles can do, is shorten themselves, when the muscle shortens itself, it doesn't pull the eye back, it actually um, is redirected through this trochlea or this little uh, pulley that is uh, on the orbital wall and that then pulls the eye down and around. Now the nerve we're talking about on this video is the sixth is the is the abducens uh, nerve that controls this lateral rectus muscle and pulls the eye out towards the ear. So the nerve uh, this is the sixth nerve. The I left, left out the fifth nerve, which is a sensory nerve that innervates the sensation on the cornea and around the eye. Um, and the sixth nerve controls this muscle that again originates back here at the annulus of zone and comes forward and attaches on the eye on the side where the ear is and pulls the eye out towards the ear. That's called abduction. So it's called the abducens nerve or the sixth nerve. So that nerve, it starts back in the brain stem and it comes forward across some bony areas and through something called the carotid cavernous sinus, which is a venous sinus right behind the eye where the carotid artery comes in and, 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 and makes a turn. Uh, anything that occurs along that route can cause a sixth nerve palsy. They can also be congenital. Um, and there's another uh, uh, miswiring that can occur before birth uh, called the Duane syndrome where it miswires with the third nerve and 
the eye also doesn't go out towards the ear. But the way these patients tend to present to my office, I actually had somebody yesterday morning, I believe, who uh, presented. And her story was that uh, about a week ago, she was at home. She was working in her yard, working in her house. She went outside. She came back in, and all of a sudden, she noticed that everything was double. And, of course, that's very disturbing to people. Um, and she started, oddly enough, uh, she, her favorite eye was the left eye, which was the eye that had the problem. She was closing her right eye in order to control the double vision because you don't develop do double vision with one eye closed. And uh, so she came into my office with a patch on the, on the right side, which was fine. Um, and uh, so literally hers just happened suddenly one day when she was working outside. And uh, the doctor who sent her to me had actually already done some labs, which were all normal. Uh, which is reassuring. I may not have gotten labs given her story. What I usually do with, with patients like that who have risk, risk factors, she had high blood pressure, uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, clotting problems. Um, any, any, any risk factor for stroke basically is, is, a risk track, is a risk factor for these kinds of events. We call it a microvascular stroke where a very small clot lodges in one of the vessels that feed the nerve somewhere in that 10 centimeters between the, the brain stem and the eye where it innervates the muscle. And uh, so that kind of stroke is a very typical type of, of presentation for a sixth nerve palsy. And of course, these people tend to present with the eye going in and uh, they can't move the eye out. So they try to move the eye out and it stops, unlike a normal eye, which will go out. So... Those tend to heal over time. I tell people that it usually will heal up to a millimeter a day. So depending on how, how much distance there is, it may take 100 days to fully heal. But most of the time, we'll see significant improvement in patients like that over the course of one to two months. So what I generally do is I evaluate them and I measure the alignment of their eye and how much it moves out. And then I see them back in a month to see if it's improved. And if it has, that's very reassuring and they don't need to go get an MRI or a CT scan or anything like that. Now, a sixth nerve palsy that develops slowly is the sort of thing that might happen if somebody has a tumor growing near the nerve that's pressing on it. And so those people, you know, maybe I see them on day one and then a month later it's the same or worse. They get an MRI because we wanna make sure there's not something there going on. Other things that could happen would be something going on in the carotid cavernous sinus or in the orbit that might press on the, on the, on the nerve that controls that muscle. Um, as I said, there's congenital causes of this as well, and then there's miswiring syndromes like Duane syndrome, which is not really part of this video, but it involves a, a miswiring between the nerve that controls this muscle, this muscle, this muscle, and this muscle, and the muscle here. And the most typical type of Duane's is where the eye won't move out towards the ear, but when the patient looks in, all the muscles fire and it actually pulls the eye back so the lids come down a bit. We call it convergence retraction. That's the most common, there's three types, um, but that's the most common presenting type. Um, so anyway, a little bit of information about the cranial nerves and more, most specifically about the sixth cranial nerve some of the common causes of six cranial nerve palsies, and a little bit about the treatments. Um, I didn't talk about prisms or occlusion. I really want to touch upon that briefly. So one of the favorite treatments that I have is just to cut a little piece of scotch tape, uh, use a penny as a, as a pattern, and place it right in the front of, of one of the lenses in order to suppress the central vision on one side, and that reduces the double vision that people are experiencing. They'll, they'll still notice it when they look off to the side or whatever, but it, it maintains their peripheral vision without, without having quite as much double vision. And uh, so that actually works quite well. Sometimes I'll use a press-on prism called a Fresnel prism uh, that we cut and paste, paste on the glasses. Um, I sometimes will put people in prisms or even do eye muscle surgery, but I always wait for quite a few months because I want to give it time to heal on its own before either putting somebody in a prism and, uh, and uh, basically training their eye to stay in that position or doing eye muscle surgery that turns out to be an overcorrection 
once the function to the nerve uh, recovers. And there's a number of things we can do. We can work on various muscles or we can even split muscles and bring them around to the side. That's not really germane to this particular discussion, but uh, there's lots of different surgical procedures that can be done for a six nerve palsy if people need it. But I usually wait for at least nine months before even suggesting surgery because I want to give that muscle, uh, that nerve, plenty of time to heal so the muscle function will return because the vast majority of the time it does. Okay, I hope that helps uh, provide some information about the sixth nerve and common policies that can occur. Have a wonderful day. Thanks. Bye.